So let's go back to that chart, because that's, sh- that's a shocking chart to me. It's assuming that there's enormous amounts of capital flight going on. Yes. And it's uh, not oh, showing so, up so in the, the currency the, the, market. One, the one that shows illicit capital flight. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So and that, you know, the diamonds obviously corroborates it. Yes. Uh, and then we'll show you also, you know, one, one of the things that when you, think about, when you think about how China operates, when you understand that they've now gone to current account negativity for the first time, in the first half of 2018, what is important to China going forward is capital flows. And so when we put together this chart from SAFE and CEIC's database, when you look at the, at the green bars there, the green bars are the current account building that reserve balance that enables China to just keep printing money on the other side of their balance sheet, yeah. running their domestic economy they want to do. That turned negative in the first half of 2018. So you see the green bars went negative. The blue, the blue bars here are, quote, uh, net errors and emissions, which is Chinese for illicit capital flows. So the only thing holding China up right now... This hasn't changed trend. We still think that this is negative now, going into 2019. Well, so I'll say that when you think about what happened in, uh, in December, crude oil dropped from $75 a barrel to 40, what did it hit, like $43 a barrel? Yeah. That's one of China's biggest uh, imports yeah. uh, is crude oil. So that, that'll give them a, a brief reprieve on the, on the current account side of things. Yeah. But again, the question, the question with that is, that, is that a secular or is that a cyclical phenomenon? That's right. This is key to understand. See, you see the dotted line? Yeah. That's volume of crude importation by China using the right y-axis. And this is the dollar value of imports. So back in the end of 2014, early 2015, when crude collapsed from 100 to 30, yeah. They got a massive reprieve in their current account. Yeah. But if you look at the volume, does that line look like equals Y equals MX plus B? It yeah. doesn't look very cyclical. No. Right? No, the, it's not. And think about this. They were importing just under 300 million tons at the beginning of 2015. The most recent number is 462 million tons. Think about this. They're now importing 50% more crude in only four years ago. 50% more today than they were importing four years ago. That's staggering, right? So is this a secular or a cyclical phenomenon? It is clearly secular when yeah. you look at this line. Yeah. And now what are, energy prices will stabilize. So you, you say, well, are they gonna have a positive current account or negative this quarter? And the fourth quarter is probably positive because oil collapsed. But in the long run, smoothed, they have a secular problem where they'll f- from now on, will have a negative current account. Right. They're starting to look more and more like Argentina and Turkey in the other twin deficit countries. Because what are they doing? They're running a negative current account. They're running a negative fiscal balance of roughly 9% of GDP. Mm-hmm. So they're running twin deficits. Their FX reserves are dwindling. And they're starting to borrow a lot of dollars. So how much of the FX reserves is liquid out of what's left? So, you know, you look at- US What's the tri- composition of that now? Well, first of all, if you remember, when, when they were let into the IMF SDR basket, yeah. They said they would disclose the composition of their reserves within two years. Well, that was a long time ago, <laughs> and we haven't seen it. So again, look at what they say, and not, or look at what they do, not what they say in China. And clearly, they lied to everyone in, with, with that statement. Yeah. But more importantly, I think, getting back to your question, what does that composition of reserves look like? One thing we know for a fact is U.S. Treasury tick data shows that they own a little bit more than, or a little bit less than $1.2 trillion in treasuries. Yeah. So we think that their only liquidity that they have that? Uh, any size of is, is our treasuries. Um, so they own a little bit of, you know, call it yen, euros, pounds, but they mostly own treasuries. We think the number's closer to 2 trillion instead of 3.2 trillion, yeah. which is dangerously below uh, adequate levels. Yeah, because it sounds like a huge sum, but for the size of the economy and the, and the potential capital flows, that can go super quick. So if we're gonna play large numbers here, yeah. The broad measure of credit in the Chinese financial system is $48 trillion worth of RMB. They only have $2 trillion of reserves. Think about these numbers, right? In their last banking crisis, which was between 98 and 2002, the loss given defaults were 80% of lo- loans that defaulted. Mm-hmm. And at one point in time, they had 35% of their entire system was non-paying. But so the, the counter argument always is for everybody is, it doesn't matter. But it's China. That's always the thing. It's China. They'll smooth it. Carl's being alarmist. Everybody's being alarmist. You're wrong, Raoul. It's not going to trade through seven oh, against know. the RMB. Um, All of this, right? You know, and th- those people sleep well at night until they don't. 
And, and that's the nickels and, and in he, front of a steamroller approach. He, yeah, I think I think what brings this to a head is the current account. When the current account goes negative and the reserve balance is going the other way, um, that the rubber meets the road. Then, as long as that balance is increasing annually along with uh, GDP and RMB terms, they can keep going. But as soon as those balances go, now their fiscal balance is negative ten, negative nine point five. Their current account balance goes negative, and it's a secular negativity. Then they have more money leaving than coming in. They have to desperately borrow, and they actually change. Now they're changing their laws. They say, oh, you know what? Now Westerners can own more than half of our banks. Not a problem. That's right. Yeah. Right. Obviously, please invest more in Chinese. They get rid of all the shit they they can. Right. So please invest more in Chinese equities. So when you look at at capital flows, this is this is a really important chart, right? This is this is from CEIC and Safe. The red bar and the stripe bar is just portfolio investment and FDI. So without Western capital flowing into China, China can't hold this all together. Literally, we are providing them. Which is Turkey and the, Argentina, right? That's the only that's way right. that they were supported. But what's interesting about China is this gives them, first of all, their economy has given them uh, the confidence uh, globally to, to be more geopolitically assertive in their dealings. Yeah. It's given their military the ability to be much more assertive in the South China Sea. And it's given Xi um, an aura that makes, that he's made the West think that somehow his economy, his economic model is superior to that of Western capitalism. And it's all a facade. The whole thing is a mirage. The whole thing is made up with the printing press, keeping a closed capital account, and hoping the world doesn't notice it. But can they get away with it? Can they smooth, do a smooth Japanese-style decline, 20, 30 years of below-trend growth or growth that trends lower, and just kind of work out the bad debts? Because you know, Japan surprised everybody of how they actually managed it. Now, it's a different economy because they have a bunch of surpluses. Yep. But yeah, The other can thing they, they have, it? I don't have the chart in here. Uh, I didn't bring it with me, but... Um, the other thing that Japan has that China doesn't, if you look at the net international FX reserve position mm -hmm. abroad, so it's the investments of Japan Inc. abroad, both, yeah. both from a sovereign perspective and from a savings perspective of the population, Japan's net international FX position is, call it 250% of their GDP. China's is 18% of GDP. And most of China's are the, the state, it's the left side of the PBOC's balance sheet lending to ports in Sri Lanka, buying the port in Greece, yeah. owning a Ugandan copper mine in Congo, uh, you know, uh, mine uh, for lithium and things like that. Those are things they're not gonna monetize and bring home, no. right? So China doesn't have that net international effects position that Japan can really rely upon uh, to keep its dream alive. Now, Japan still runs a positive current account and they, they have as much debt as, Japan has a quadrillion yen of debt, right? Yeah. They also have a quadrillion yen of net international savings, but China doesn't. So Japan is a completely different animal. So there's two things I want to put into this. One of the things you know, that I've been talking about, I think the probability of a global recession is, is reasonably high at this point. What do you think it is? About 80%. 80? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. It's very high, and all the data I look at looks like it's, it's coming. Mm -hmm. Could it be 2016 again where we kind of avoid it because the Chinese got us out of it? I don't think that's coming. We, we saw that a fiscal stimulus in the US last two quarters and it's not gonna help. So we're running out of something. Mm -hmm. We're running out of ability to get around this. Looks like Australia's about to go into the recession. You know, all of this is starting to happen. So let's assume Keteris Paribus in China, they don't do anything different, but the world goes into recession. They're screwed, right? Mm. Yeah, I think. Because they can't sell goods. And then so their, their current account. Goes more negative. Exactly, yeah. because you know, that offsets the oil thing. Because the fact is, because we saw it happened, a similar kind of thing happened when oil fell last time, it's because world trade fell as well. That's right. And if Chinese cannot sell enough goods, then that's the end of the game. I, I think the writing's on the wall when you look at all, everything that you look at. You look at Australia, you look at Southeast Asia, but look at Italy just entered a recession a week ago. Yeah. You you look at the subcomponents of Germany's industrial production, it's actually tracking right this minute as bad as it was when Lehman came down. And you know what it's highly correlated to? China. So, uh, th but that's my point. Yeah. Like Germany's headed into a recession. The US numbers look really good right now. It's because we just stimulated at full employment. That's right. That stimulus, I think peak stimulus is February 27th.